What's going on, peeps? It's Wrath here, hanging out today, playing some Idle Heroes. I want to thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me today. If you like the video, don't forget, smash that thumbs up button to show your support. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe as well. All right, guys, we're here today to talk about the top units in the Abyss faction. Um, that's what we're going for. And this is going into 2019, so it's not like end of 2019. So if you're watching this later on in the year, some of these things might have changed. That's just how the game rolls. But for right now, these are the top units of the Abyss Faction, in my opinion. Well, so we'll talk about what I consider the top heroes in a little bit more detail. Then we'll go down to more mid-tier units, or heroes that are kind of more honorable mentions that do have uses, but maybe not so much for the super late game. And then we'll talk about what fodder is, so if you guys, if, you, if you're really new, you know what you can kind of feel safe using is just food and not worry about throwing copies away. So, we'll start things off here. Generally speaking, it's, it's this bottom row here. It's going to be your top units. And um, we'll talk about Scary first. Now, Scary, being a really cool unit, he's actually pretty old. He's been around for a good while. He's one of the few units in the game that have a really, I would say, poor description in his skills that doesn't accurately tell you what Scary actually does. Now, whether this is just a bug that they never fixed on Scary, or if they just improperly wrote the skills and whatnot, I don't know. That's just kind of how the devs work. Um, I don't know what they're always doing. But anyway, Scary, we'll go through and read his skills and such, and we'll talk about where he's good and so... Let's start out here, boop, with the Death Ray. Already sounds pretty solid, right? Now, a newer player might read this and think it's pretty weak just based on the amount of damage it deals. It's not a very heavy attack. It deals 114% of his, uh, his attack... Uh, slow down, Wrath. It deals 114% of his attack as damage against all enemies. It's going to tag them with a lightning mark and has a 30% chance to tag them with an extra lightning mark. Lightning marks essentially little marks they put on the enemy that are little red and shocky, they look hot, they look real hot, but they boost the damage they take from Scary down by 35%. Now this says it only boosts the active skill damage of Scary. That's not actually true. I mean, you can see this in like the Tower of Oblivion, especially when you fight waves of all Scaries. Um, later on, like 500 or something, you'll start seeing more of those. There might be some on the way before 500, I don't know. But you'll start to notice that as you get more marks on your team, Scary's basic attack also hits much, much harder. That's because this uh, this little lightning mark actually boosts both his active skill damage and his basic attack damage. For some reason, they didn't write it that way. I don't know if that was a bug or if they just didn't know. Um, <laughs> you never know. Coding's weird. But anyways, it actually turns out being really solid because you'll see why here shortly. Anyways, first passive, boosted reduced damage. Always a nice thing. Helps keep you alive on a unit that relies on stacking marks to get the max amount of damage. You obviously want to keep them alive for a long time, so that definitely plays in there. Um, a HP boost and a crit boost. Crit's always nice. Boost your damage. Kind of just, it's never a bad thing to have extra crit. Not a bad deal. Um, second passive here, basic attack tags the, uh, target with a lightning mark. Lightning mark, again, we already talked about that, boosts the damage by 35%. It also steals the target's attack by 10% for two rounds. Now, if you're looking at this, you'd be like, well, that's, uh, that's okay. You know, he hits a person. That's not how it works. His basic attack actually hits the entire enemy team for 50% of his attack is damage. Why that's not written there, I don't know. It just isn't. Um, it's just, I don't know. There's some problems with how this is written. It's just the way the game works. But anyways... That's how it works. You hit everybody. So it's actually a really powerful passive because he hits the entire enemy team, steals their attack, and also makes them all take more damage from his attacks. So it's, it's pretty nasty, and it's one of the reasons Scary's, you know, in general, pretty nasty. He has a lot of stuff that works for him. Last passive, boop. Um, anytime he gets hit, so anytime he takes damage from anybody, he's going to put a lightning mark on them as well, and he's also going to boost his crit damage by 15% for three rounds. So that's not bad. If you have Scary in your one slot and he gets hit a lot, A, he's going to put out a lot of lightning marks really quick, but he's also going to boost his crit damage by a lot really fast as well, and that means when he does do his active skills or his basic attacks, since he already has a, a natural crit chance boost in his passives, if he does land those crits, they're going to hit much, much harder. So, Scary is a pretty solid guy. You look at his damage, you're like, eh, 114%, that's not a lot. It isn't. But because he puts marks on people with his active skills, his basic attacks, and when he's just getting hit, it actually goes pretty insane, especially if you have more than one of them. I'll just back out of here real quick, like, and we'll pop into the arena. I'm assuming one of these guys, yeah, number two in the arena right now. He has three, oh, he only has two E3 Scaries. He must have dropped one for a KB. Look at that guy changing it up. Um, was there another guy? Yeah, this guy's still running the three scaries. 
But Scary's active skill marks don't just pertain to himself, okay? It's not just going to boost this one Scary's damage, it boosts every Scary in your team's damage. So if you get two Scaries put together, you have double the marks, so you end up doing like double the damage. You get three Scaries in there, and so on and so forth. You just get crazy scaling with these marks, and he does insane damage against bosses, and also in the arena. He can nuke people pretty easily. And this is why Scary, I would say, is still definitely top tier of the Abyss faction. Like you see, on the, even on this server, really old server, in the top 10 teams, you've got people running him still. He's a really good unit. He's good because he's versatile. Um, once you get him to E3, he has some Aspen potential for like actually pushing. Um, before that, not so much of an actual push unit, more as like a node breaker. Um, but... He's really solid in both PvE damage, so things like boss fights and Tower of Oblivion, of course, as well. He'll work really solid in that area. Um, but he's nice there because all these marks stacking up boost his damage by a lot. If you have two scaries in your team, you're doing the same thing. You're going to hit really, really hard versus bosses. I think some of the highest damage numbers recorded in the game so far have been with scary-based teams because he hits like a freaking beast. But he's also solid in PvP because if you can keep him alive, even if he just doesn't do a, a, a darn thing, all game, if he's just getting punched on, slapped in the face, never gets to attack until like wave 8, he finally gets a chance to attack, it doesn't matter, because all those times he's been stacking up these marks, he can one-shot the entire enemy team. Seen it happen, had it happen to me, it's not always fun when it happens to you, but that's how scary it works. He's an insane burst hero when it comes to PvP, um, especially if you have more than one of them stacking up these marks. If one can survive and get uncrowd controlled or something just for one turn, that can be all you need to win a match. I've seen it happen a lot. It's pretty cool when it happens personally. I, I like seeing people one shot teams. It's kind of fun. Um, but he does have weaknesses in the arena as well. Mainly, he has no resistance to crowd control. So if you do perma stun, freeze, petrify, whatever you do to keep scary from attacking, um, he's not going to do a buttload of damage because he he's not doing any damage. He's frozen. I mean, that's kind of his weakness. If you can keep him crowd controlled and burst him to death, he doesn't really do anything. But if he does get free, even for one turn later on in the match, that can be all it takes. So Scary is still really solid, not only in PvE for your boss fights, but also in the PvP area. He still does really well. Um, now, in some of the servers where you get a ton of GVE teams, we have a couple on this one, not many. Um, we've got one in the top right now, I believe, Dr. Boom. Yeah, GVE, the good versus evil, all light and dark team. They still can beat them. It's not a 100% win ratio from what I hear from the people that actually fight up here. It's more like a 50-50 kind of thing. Like sometimes they win, sometimes they don't. Um, it's just one of those deals. Um, but obviously, Abyss team still very powerful and scary is generally in all of the all Abyss teams because he's very good at his burst damage. With that said, we're going to move on from scary and we're going to move over here to Cruz. Just we're going to go in order. It's not like in order of them being good or bad. It's just, it's, I don't know, left to right works for me, whatever. Cruz. Cruz. All right. Cruz is a priest. He's a pretty fast priest, actually, which is not a bad deal, and it actually works out kind of in his favor. We're going to go through his skills like we did with Scary. Boop. Start things out with the weak curse. Deals 150% of his attack as damage against four random enemies and weakens the targets for three rounds. Um, the weakness mark, it says down here, uh, it makes the enemies take an additional 50% damage. And it doesn't stack, though, so you can't have 50% stack and then get another active skill and it stack again. It's just a one-time deal. It only stacks up one time, which isn't bad. It's actually a nice little boost to your damage, and it works in PvE and PvP, but it's also going to boost one ally's energy by 100. Essentially, what that means is it gives somebody on your team a skill cast. Now, if they haven't cast their skill yet, for example, in my team, my Cruz has the highest speed of my team. I don't have a super great PvP team. Okay, just going to put that out there. Um, but because he's so fast, he will cast this before other units get to go. What that means, if they already have 100 energy because they're ready to cast their active skill, that converts that energy into skill damage. So that attack's going to hit even harder than it would before, and it's actually pretty powerful. You can nuke some people down a lot better that way. It just kind of works. Just kind of works. Anyways, moving down, boop, first passive here. His basic attack targets the backline enemies, deals 90% damage, and reduces um, their armor by 15%. Little armor strip, not a huge armor strip, but that's not bad. Anytime you're removing a little bit of armor, it's extra damage you can deal. It's not a bad thing. But the big thing about it is also going to heal two random allies for 20% of the allies' maximum health. That's the big thing, and that's the thing the game's really missing a lot right now is percent-based heals, um, because, like, old heroes that were, you know really good back in the day, like Vesa back at 10 star, they were really good healers because they could keep up with your team's HP. Well, with the addition of E3 units having massive health pools like Valkyries with like 10 million plus HP in battle, um, 
in battle. There's di- there's a whole different stats than what you see here compared to what's actually done in battle. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But anyways, these percent based heals are enormous. When I mean, you're talking about two million plus health in a single basic attack. It's really nice, especially since it's tied to a basic attack. It means even if Cruz does get silenced by a demon hunter or whatnot, he can still heal your team, and it's actually a pretty powerful heal. So it's a nice little basic attack, um, better than most units' basic attacks, in my opinion, because it has a lot of utility to it. So anyways, second passive here, run-of-the-mill passive, HP boost, speed boost, but he also gets 20% reduced damage. Not a bad thing if you want to keep him alive, which uh, generally you don't want him to die immediately. It's never a good thing. Um, but you don't necessarily want Cruz to never die because of his last passive. Bing. Um, when he falls below 50% health, he has a 75% chance to stun all enemies for two rounds. That's pretty powerful crowd control. And when Cruz launched, a lot of people thought he was OP because of it. Like, oh, you can't beat Cruz. They've got a Cruz, you lose. Not necessarily, it's just, it's RNG, whether or not it lands. You can have this thing proc and stun one enemy, <laughs> okay? It happens, not very often, but it does happen. Either way, it's still really powerful, uh, mainly in PvP, but also in things like the Tower of Oblivion or in Seal Land, um, where crowd control is actually useful. It's not bad. It's actually pretty good. So where does Cruz kind of fit into the mold? Again, definitely, in my opinion, one of the best Abyss heroes there is, or I wouldn't be talking about him right now. Um... But he's good because he's well-rounded. You can take Cruz and put him in a PvE team to fight bosses, and he'll do well. Not only is he going to function as a little bit of extra DPS by giving you the 50... Not He's not DPS. He contributes to your overall damage um, because of his weakness mark. He's also going to give your team more skill cast, which depending on how you run your team or who's in your team, like say you have someone like Horus in your team, that can actually boost your overall damage anyway because more skill casts, you know, it just it's a thing. It carries down the road. Um, but also... A little bit of armor strip, never a bad thing, but it's also the heal's kind of nice, especially in later bosses that hit a little bit harder. Having a heal tied to your basic attack is never a bad thing. When you talk about the Tower of Oblivion, which is another PvE mode, um, this right here, having that stun, is really powerful. And again, like I said, when you go to PvP, having that stun is really good. And even this is not bad in PvP. Making enemies take additional damage and giving people um, skill cast on your team, it's not bad. Cruz is still a really solid unit. You still see him in a lot of teams, even rainbow teams. You'll still see the Cruz pop up in there because he's a very versatile unit and you don't really go wrong building one. If you want to use him for a PVE support, he's not bad there. You want to use him in PVP for support. Again, he's not going to be bad there. So Cruz, in my opinion, is still definitely one of the top tier abyss units because he's well-rounded. He works well. He doesn't do anything in the Aspen. Okay, if you're if you're wanting your Cruz to be an Aspen god... That's the one thing he sucks one at. He's not an Aspen hero, not even a little bit for anything. He doesn't do much there. But outside of that, I mean, PvP, boss damage, stuff like that, you can't really go wrong building Cruz. He's very versatile and a very solid choice. With that said, we're going to move on. Moving on to the old KB. Look at that. The dwarf god himself, King Barton. King Bartan. Um, this guy's he's a little different. He's different than most heroes in the game, and he's kind of cool. I like it. But anyways, we'll read through his skills like we always do. Hammer's Verdict. Ooh, hot sounding. Deals 210% of his attack as damage against backline enemies. Meanwhile, it boosts his own reduced damage by 35% and attack by 40% for three rounds. So, I mean, it's decent burst damage, 210% of attack. He doesn't have a hugely high attack stat, but he's going to gain attack with his active skill anyway. Um, but also that reduced damage. Reduced damage is nice. It means it takes longer to kill you, and that's generally a good thing. Generally a good idea if it takes longer to kill you in almost any area of the game. First passive, Heroic Charge. His basic attack targets four random enemies, dealing 125% of his attack as damage, and also has a 25% chance to stun the targets for two rounds. That's pretty good. Anytime you see a basic attack that has crowd control tied to it, that's not bad, especially in PvP and things like the Tower of Oblivion. It doesn't work so well against bosses because obviously bosses can't be crowd controls. It doesn't really matter. Um, But yeah, pretty solid basic attack there. Extra damage, hits four people, and has a chance to stun. So it works. It works. And it pairs well with his other passives as well. So boom, right here, next passive. Kind of run-of-the-mill passive with HP and attack. But he does gain 35% control immunity. That's really big when it comes to things like PvP. Um, even in the tower, it can be helpful. Um, but control immunity essentially means your ability to resist being crowd controlled. Stun, freeze, petrify, whatever. He has a 35% natural resistance to that. So it means about a third of the time, he's going to dodge being crowd controlled, which is great. That's always a nice thing. But he also deals an extra 100% of his attack as damage on stun foes. Well, since he already stuns people... Um, 
That's nice. That means he's going to kind of synergize with his own damage. He's going to boost his own damage with his basic attack, which is great. Not a bad deal. That brings us to his last passive, which is arguably one of the reasons most people build him. When he gets hit, he deals a counterattack to the entire enemy team for 150% of his attack as damage. And this will also affect stunned units. So if you're stunned and he counterattacks, he's going to get that extra damage boost on you. It's nasty. Um, I've seen King Bartons drop insane damage in PvP battles. Usually he's one of the hardest hitting units on the enemy team. Um, sometimes they have Valkyrie will outdo it, but you know, either way, it's not bad. That huge counterattack right there is really annoying to deal with. That's why you see a lot of King Bartons in the one slot, because the more times he gets hit, the more counterattacks he's going to drop. The more counterattacks he drops, obviously his damage is going to go way up. It's, it's, it's solid. It's, that's why he's here in the top units. He's solid. But he pairs really well with himself, and obviously he synergizes well with anybody else that has stuns. So King Barton and a Cruise, for example, will still have decent synergy because if Cruise stuns people and he falls below half health, your King Barton's going to get a nice little damage boost on all of his attacks. Same thing with someone like Valentino, Faithblade, anybody that can stun a unit, King Barton is going to pair pretty well with them. Um, he pairs pretty well with himself. So if you run two King Bartons like you've seen in the top arena teams earlier, um, he's going to pair well with himself. He's going to drop more stuns on those basic attacks. He's, they're both going to be counterattacking a lot. It just, it works. Solid unit for PvP. With that said, when it comes to boss fighting, not so much King Barton's forte. Now he's not horrible at it because he has a counterattack that hits three enemies. Um, it does kind of work when you're fighting Pray for Fire bosses that have three bosses to attack. Any kind of single boss or even the double bosses in broken spaces, he's really not going to hit super hard. I mean, he'll do better than most crowd control based tanks, like a corpse demon would suck huge ones compared to a King Barton in a boss fight, um, but he's not terrible for what he does. I mean, he's going to work okay in those areas. He's not great. He's pretty tanky, which is always a nice thing. He can put up a little bit of damage, but not a lot of utility in a boss fight. You don't see any armor stripping, things like that that can help your team. Um, He's just not a great boss unit. If you're going to build for bosses, you don't generally build King Barton. Um, but for things like um, the Tower of Oblivion, PvP, really solid unit. I would say he's probably one of the better ones um, for the Abyss faction. Um, but also when it comes to the Aspen Dungeon, he can have some use there as well. Now, primarily when he gets to E3 and gets that Resilience passive, he kind of takes off more because... You know, having resilience is kind of a big deal. <laughs> it heals you based on your health, which has a pretty big health pool already. It just works. It's a nice thing. So once you get to resilience, he works way better in the Aspen Dungeon. Before you get to resilience, he's more going to be for like a single node to jump in there and break a node for you. Um, not really good against healers because... They can outheal his counterattacks, and he doesn't have enough burst damage on his own, in my experience, to actually take down the healer nodes. Um, but once you get him to E3, pretty solid guy. Um, I would say an E3 King Barton can easily get you to Hell Mode Plus. Um, I don't know how well he'd do getting to Hell 50. I think he'd need some serious backup. But to get to Hell, I guarantee you can make it. He's a solid dude. Solid, solid dude. That's King Barton for you. Boop. And let's move on to the last one, in my opinion, is Cthulhu. Cthulhu. This is the newest Abyss unit and probably one of the, the lesser used ones, actually. You don't see a ton of Cthulhu's around. He did pop up in a bad time. He popped up right after Valkyries were out and everybody was building Valkyrie. Valkyrie's still all the craze, so he kind of got forgotten. But he does have some serious skill usages. He works decently well in a lot of different teams, and depending on the team you run, he can be a really instrumental part of it. So anyways, we'll read through his skills. Like a bam. Terror Blade. Whoa. I don't know what that was. Deals 236% of his attack as damage, gets three random enemies, and detonates all burning and bleeding debuffs on the targets. Instantly dealing 120% of the total remaining dot damage, um, and it's capped by 1,000% of his attack. That's not bad. Essentially what this does is it converts long-lasting damage into an immediate burst. That's pretty useful. It's useful in a lot of situations, mainly in PvP. Um, in PvP, generally long-lasting damage or damage that ticks down over time isn't quite as effective because you want that damage to get hit immediately. They you know, that, don't want to have time to heal and stuff like that and kind of negate the damage in general because resilience kind of hurts damage over time unless it's really beefy damage over time because resilience on a lot of heroes heals for a huge amount, especially when they start getting low in health. What Cthulhu does is he takes those long-lasting dots, or even if it's a dot just lasts for two rounds, and he detonates it immediately. So he goes and props all the damage, plus another 20%, 
which is nice. Gives them a little extra damage boost on that dot. Um, but it turns that long lasting damage into immediate damage. And that's a pretty solid deal. It works, like I said, much better in PvP where it can turn the tide of a battle from being really long and they're getting resilience passive to keep healing themselves. And you can go ahead and pop those dots and then boom, immediately shut somebody down. It works. It's not bad. Anyways, moving on. Moving on. The first passive. Kind of a run-of-the-mill passive here with attack and HP, but his special deal here is he's immune to being burned and bled. Um, however, monster damage will still hit him. There's only one monster right now that has a bleed on it, and that is Wolf. Um, the burning monster hasn't been launched yet. I don't think there's any other burn monsters. Let me think. No, there's not. I was, I was like, there could be, but there isn't. There definitely isn't. Not yet. The Phoenix is supposed to be the burn monster, but it's not here yet. Anyways... The monster stats, or uh, dots, can still go through this immunity and burn or bleed him, which, you know, whatever, it's thing. Um, but any normal unit trying to burn or bleed Cthulhu will have no effect. And this is useful in a lot of situations. Um, when it comes to PvP, in my experience, the best thing this does is it saves your units from Valkyrie's big, heavy, damage-based um, inner HP burns. Because that's how Valkyrie does 99% of her damage, is through her health and those big nasty burns she drops. Well, if you can build a Cthulhu with enough, enough HP that he will have higher health than the other units, as long as he gets hit by Valkyrie's active skill, he's going to take her burn effect onto himself. Well, since he can't be burned, it turns into a zero damage kind of thing, where she just hits you with her attack, which isn't really that big. Everyone builds her for HP. So that's one of his big uses in PvP. But when it comes to things like the Aspen Dungeon, a lot of people struggle with waves, especially later down in the road, um, when you get to Hell Mode and such, even before you get to Hell Mode, um, Bloodblade waves with their bleed damage, it eats a lot of people alive. Cthulhu has no issues with Bloodblade in the Aspen Dungeon because Bloodblade can't bleed him. If he can't drop that bleed dot, he doesn't get the attack boost. It just, it kind of makes Bloodblade a joke, is what it does for the Aspen Dungeon. Really easy to beat Bloodblades with Cthulhu. It's a nice little addition to the Aspen team. But also things like Fat Moo, and you'd think, Fat Moo? Really? Yes. When you get to Hell Mode, Fat Moo is an absolute beast. He drops humongous nasty burns, and if you don't have a, a immunity to being burnt, it eats through units. It can take a Valkyrie and kill it. An E3 Val, get wrecked on by Fat Moo. You gotta watch the Fat Moos, alright? And even things like Mirage with the bleed damage, you'd think, Mirage, not really a big deal. When you have four of them dropping bleeds on you, it is kind of a big deal. And in this case, Cthulhu, without being, you can't be bled, it definitely helps out in those areas. So he definitely has use in the Aspen Dungeon. It's not a bad deal. That little passive right there is really handy. Moving on, his second passive, when he takes uh, damage, he's going to deal a burn dot and a bleed dot equal to 25% of his attack against three random enemies for three rounds. This isn't bad. Since he detonates burns and bleeds anyways, this just kind of artificially boosts Cthulhu's damage. It's, just, it's extra DPS for him because it's not going to only drop the burn and bleed right then. When his active skill comes around, he gets to detonate those for extra damage. So it's kind of nice little extra damage over time. This pairs really nicely with units like Flamestrike, who get passive stacks when people get burned. Um, since he'll be burned anytime he's attacked, you can get Flamestrike to have some pretty huge stacks of attack and skill damage boost really early on, which means she can nuke really hard. Kind of a synergy pairing there. Gotta keep your eye out for those, they are important. Um, but moving down to the last passive here, the Soul Shackle. <sighs> I don't know what that was either. When taking damage from a burning target, he gains 15 energy. When taking damage from a bleeding target, he heals himself for 30% of his attack as HP. Not huge. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's not like a terrible pass or anything. It doesn't make a massive difference in most battles. But, you know, every little difference does add up over time. That's just how it works. Um, it could use a buff, I would say. But, eh, we don't want to make him too OP, right? Maybe we do. Do we want to make Cthulhu the next OP monster? Maybe we do. But anyways, solid guy. Solid guy all around. When it comes to things like boss damage, that's probably Cthulhu's biggest weak point because he doesn't actually deal a lot of damage himself. Most of Cthulhu's damage comes from your other units. So if you have a Sigmund, a Valkyrie, a Shia, you know, dropping those bleeds and burns, he's going to go ahead and steal their damage over time effect and pop it himself for a little extra damage. So while he does contribute a little extra damage to your team because he is adding, you know, that extra damage from bursting the dots... He's not necessarily contributing a lot of damage himself. He just gets that little bit extra. It's mostly their damage. He just kind of takes over and just does it all at once. Which isn't a bad thing, but mainly in things like Tower of Oblivion or in PvP, that burst is really more effective. When it comes to boss fights, generally your goal is to last 15 rounds. Pick up. Uh, hmm. 
15 rounds anyway. So if you're lasting for 15 rounds, most of your dots have time to just carry out over time anyway and just proc naturally. So there's no reason to burst them. There's no real rush to get that damage out immediately. Cthulhu doesn't do a whole lot in boss fights. Outside of that area, when it comes to things like the Aspen Dungeon, especially when you get up to E3 and grab that Resilience, he has a lot of uses as node breakers for hard heavy nodes that Valkyries have issues with, like those burns and bleeds, areas like that. Um, but also when it comes to PvP in the tower, he's really handy. Being able to soak up Valkyries burns and take no damage is a real big selling point to a lot of teams, and it can turn a battle that you would lose every time into one that you can actually win, or at worst, tie. And if you're the defender and you tie, you actually win. So he's kind of a defensive counter to Valkyrie, in my opinion. Not so much an offensive one, because if Valkyrie does manage to stay alive and kill your entire team off except for Cthulhu, they will both last for the entire 15 rounds, just kind of slapping each other around, and neither of them able to kill each other. That's generally how it ends, so you tie. If you attack and tie, you lose, but if you're defending and you tie, you win. And that's kind of where I would say he kind of, he kind of counters Valkyrie in a soft sense. Um, but you can also make it work for you on offense. If you can get your Valkyries burns to land on this guy, not your other units, you can still get around it. It still works. It's just it's a thing. PvP, Tower of Oblivion, Aspen Dungeon, probably his big three, uh, big three selling points. Boss damage, nah, not so much. If you're going for a boss build, um, you don't build Cthugas. You're going to build Scary or Cruz, um for the support or the damage from Scary, obviously. But definitely a solid unit, and one I feel still has use in the top tier units of the Abyss Faction. With that said, that brings us to the mid-tier units. Now, we don't talk a ton about mid-tier units or go, like, super in-depth on them because, you know, they're not as important, I would say, as the top tier ones. Unless you love to build them. If you just love to build these units, then build them. Absolutely. Um, but the first mid-tier unit we're going to talk about here would be Queen. You see a lot of queens early on, mainly because a lot of people make the noob mistake of spending their guild coins to get copies of her early game, and they kind of, you know, just keep building her. Um, but, queen. What does queen do? Um, previously, she didn't have any kind of damage over time, so she wasn't really that great in even the mid-game, in my opinion. Um, but she's pretty handy in early to mid-game PvP, but also against bosses. She can do some uh, some decent damage there with her bleed damage, but also her counterattack isn't a bad thing either. If you run her in your one slot, she'll obviously get more counterattacks and kind of boost her damage numbers up a bit. She's nowhere near as useful as someone like a Sigmund, who has a lot more utility in a boss fight. Um, but for PvP, a lot of people really like her crit reduction. Um, her active skill reduces enemy crit chance and crit damage, which is definitely a good thing. It's always nice to have that happen. Um, keeps them from nuking you, which in early to mid game, nukes are probably your biggest threat, I would say. Because even early in mid game, Avesa can end your run by dropping a nasty nuke and killing four of your units. It happens. It's a thing. When you get more to the end game, um, teams revolve more around crowd control and kind of trying to keep you from doing your damage more. And in those situations, she doesn't do well because she has no resistance to crowd control. But even her basic attack reduces enemies' crit and boosts her own crit damage or has a chance to boost her own crit damage um, and her own crit. So she crits pretty hard, has decent crit damage, but again, with no reduction to um, crowd control in any kind of in-game or late-game PvP teams, she just gets kind of walked over and wrecked on. Even in the mid-game sometimes, if they use um, decent crowd control, she won't do as much for you. Um, but early to mid-game, you see quite a few of them because A, she's really easy to build, and B, she has she's pretty versatile for an early-game unit. She's not a terrible unit. With that said, we move to the next one. In my opinion, the next mid-tier unit here is Karim. Karim, kind of a slow starter. He's not someone that pops out the gate and is like, Wow, Karim! Um, but once you get Karim to 10 star plus, you start to see his good side because at 10 star he gains this heal on his active skill and it's a heal based on damage dealt, not on his own attack stat. So if you build your Karim for a high crit build where he crits a lot and hits heavy with those crits, he's going to heal a lot and that works in a lot of situations. It keeps you alive in boss fights, keeps him alive in PvP, also dealing a lot of damage to the enemy at the same time. Um, but even the Aspen Dungeon, you start seeing that really pair back to him because getting those big heals in the Aspen Dungeon keeps him alive there as well and allows you to use Karim as a main Aspen hero. An E3 Karim, I would say with some luck, can make it to hell. He is a little squishy when you hit field nodes and things like that. It can be... It's it's tough to keep him going because if he gets stun locked, it's game over for him. Um, but early to mid-tier unit... Not bad at all. Once you get him to 10 star plus. Now at 9 star he does gain um, the heal based on his basic attack. It's not enough in my opinion to actually make him really solid at 9 star. He's still pretty weak. Um, he's a pretty low, H, uh, pretty low HP stat so he does get killed pretty fast. 
Um, but like I said, later down the road, while he's still pretty squishy, he has a lot of healing to keep himself topped off and he snowballs. So as enemies die, like in PvP, he's going to gain attack. So he's going to hit harder and harder the more enemies you kill, which means an early game E3 Karim can solo a lot of teams because as long as you kill those little weak units off in the back line, he gains that big attack buff. When it comes down to him versus the other E3 he's facing, he has a huge amount of attack to deal with him. So he's not bad early to mid game. Late game, you see him traded out again because in PvP, he just doesn't have the crowd control resistance to stay. Um, he gets, you know, stunned, frozen, and it's game over. Pretty squishy health stat. He gets kind of nuked. And when it comes to P uh, to boss damage, there's a lot of better boss fighters out there that don't rely on the extra attack when, you're, uh, when heroes die. Um, because when you're fighting a boss, generally they're not dying. <laughs> you fight them for rounds and rounds and rounds. So he does do decent boss damage, not saying he doesn't. He's just not one of the top tier damage units. So generally later game, you see Karim get swapped out for better units. With that said, we got a couple last here, a couple little more honorable mentions. I know this video's run a little bit long, but you know, whatever. Length is not a bad thing. <laughs> Whatever. All right. <laughs> Something's wrong with me. Um, Dan Talion. You'd be surprised how versatile Dan Talion is now, especially early game. Um, having this nice little heal, he has like a little mini resilience that he gets early on, um, which you don't get resilience on any other hero until E3. On Dan Talion, you get it at five star. He's got a nice little passive that every time he takes damage, it's not exactly resilience, but when he takes damage, he heals himself for 4% of his missing HP. It's not that way at five star. It's a little less, but whatever. Either way, the more HP you have on Dantalion, the harder it is to kill him because as you get him lower in health, if you're hitting with weak units like AoE crowd control units and stuff like that, they won't be able to kill Dantalion. He'll just keep healing up more than they can deal in damage and they'll either tie and lose in PvP battles um, or if you're attacking, it might be enough for your Dantalion to actually swing the win by killing them off just through a war of attrition. It works. It's not bad. It's pretty useful, especially in things like the Aspen Dungeon. You can get a Dantalion. I don't know what an E3 Dantalion could push. I mean, I would say Nightmare 50 is guaranteed, but going to hell, uh, I don't know. It might be a little tough to swing that. I know he's pretty solid when he, with his tankiness, but I don't know. You'd, you definitely, I think you'd need a node breaker for sure for any kind of healer nodes. He doesn't have enough damage to deal with healers, but he's not a bad dude. He has some burns, his extra damage versus warriors, which is really nice early game against warrior bosses. There's a lot of them early game in the early guild boss fights. Tons of warriors, which means your Dantalion will do a lot more damage than a lot of other units will, and it kind of works out. It's not a bad deal. His passes boost his damage against warriors even higher, so he's very good at fighting warriors, and you'd be surprised how many times I've killed King Bartons with Dantalion. It happens. It absolutely happens. If you can get it to go, he's got the damage, it'll work. You can put King Bartons down. The problem is if King Barton keeps stun locking him, he can't do any damage, and if he can't do any damage, you obviously can't kill the King Barton. It ain't gonna happen. But he can. He can in some situations, but early game PvP, kind of more of a troll than anything in early game PvP because he has that little heal built in. Um, when it comes to the Aspen Dungeon, again, that heal is actually pretty nice. It's not a bad thing. Um, boss battles, unless you're fighting a warrior, no. He doesn't do a lot of damage versus anything that's not really a warrior. Um, there's a lot of better damage units out there for boss fights, but early game, like I said, if you're kind of building what you can get. Dantalion's very easy to get. He drops in five-star shards. Um, he can drop from your energy you get from heroic summons. He's pretty readily available, and that means he's easy to build. The easier to build, it's not a bad deal, especially being now that you can convert heroes and swap them around. A 10-star Dantalion's not that bad of a thing. If you get tired of him, you can swap him for a 10-star King Barton or a 10-star Scary. It's just not that big of a deal anymore. But anyways, I still think Dan Tyne's a pretty solid mid-tier unit. And that brings us to the last one here, and that's Berea. Berea! Bang! Slap him with a hammer. Pretty solid guy. He's like the, the earlier version of King Barton, kind of ish. Not really at all, but he looks similar. They're both kind of dwarfy with hammers, okay? It makes sense. But he has a really high health pool. The big thing about Berea... Previously, this last passive didn't do what it does now. Now that it's been changed, it's pretty pa it's pretty powerful. Um, every single round, he gains 10% armor break, 15% crit, and 25% crit damage. That's not bad, because it has no round limitation, which means if you go 10 rounds, you're going to have 10 times that. Obviously, you can't. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cap on your crit damage. You can't go over 150%, which it, you know, it makes sense. If you can build crazy, crazy high crit damage, you could nuke almost anything, which is ridiculous. But you will get your Berea by wave 10 to have 100% armor break on himself, a full 100% crit, and maxed out crit damage. Which means he's going to crit every time he attacks, he's going to have high crit damage, and he's going right through armor, which is really solid in boss fights. 
Outside of boss fights, he doesn't really have a lot of use. Um, he does strip armor, which is not a bad thing. Again, for boss fights, removing armor is not bad. He boosts his own attack and armor break with his active skill. Um, when he has higher health than the person he's attacking, it doesn't say that in his active skill here, he does an extra 20% of the enemy's max health. That's more for PvP. However, Berea is really not that good in PvP. No crowd control resistance at all built in here, which means once he gets crowd control, it's almost game over, and you can knock him out pretty easily. That being said, similar to Scary, if you do get unlucky and a Berea makes it to like wave 6 or 7 and gets unstunned with an active skill, if he's attacking your back line, he can one-shot your entire back line. I've seen it happen. It doesn't happen very often, but he does have that humongous burst potential in PvP that is kind of fun to watch, but it doesn't last long. Early to mid-game, uh, once you get to the end game, a lot of crowd control, heavy nuking units, he just kind of falls off and you don't see him used there anymore. But against bosses, still has very respectable damage output, and not just the damage output, because he steals armor with his basic attack, He's also going to pro uh, provide some utility for your team in removing enemy armor, which means your entire team will do more damage. Pretty solid guy. But that's the, the honorable mentions. The rest are pretty much fodder tier. I don't see anyone ever building Margaret's unless it's just for funsies, because she's super duper 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 super squishy. If you sneeze on her the wrong way, she will die, and her dots just don't hit hard enough to be useful. Um, they just She doesn't have enough damage backing up her... T she's just weak. I mean, she's really, really weak. She needs a huge buff to ever be used. I doubt she'll ever get one because she's a really old hero, um, but primarily fodder. Same thing with Lord Balrog, Fatmu, and Gusta. These are guys, if you get them, you're pretty safe. Go ahead and throw in their copies into six-star foods and stuff like that. You don't really have to worry about them because they're really common. They come around often. Margaret's not super common, but she's not super good either, so... She's still fodder. Um, but Fatmu, Balrog, and Gusta, you get absolute boatloads of. You get quite a few Dantalians as well mixed in there, and even Queens. Um, but these guys are mainly food. Use a lot of them. Make them your 9-star and 10-star foods. My Gusta, uh, 10-star here was. Gusta. He was my 10-star food. Super easy to build. Get copies of them all the time. Easy to make food. And that's what you like in your fodder is easy to make. You don't want to make a King Barton fodder, because A, it's harder to get his copies, and B, he's good. Don't fodder him unless you're not going to go for PvP, in which case, eh, up to you. But anyways, that's the basic rundown of the Abyss faction. Of course, these are just my opinions. If you disagree with them, that's absolutely fine. That's the way the world works. Um, but those are my opinions from my experience in the game, seeing what people use, seeing why they use them, using some of them myself. Um, these are what I would say are the definitely the top tier units of the Abyss faction. And then your mid-tier units, they're not bad. You see them a lot because they're, they're pretty solid for what they do. You still see all Abyss teams, which is crazy. Um, you don't see a lot of any other one-faction teams in the game, honestly. I've never seen an All-Shadow, All-Fortress. I've not I've seen a couple All-Forests, but not recently. Um, but I still see quite a few all Abyss teams. It's a pretty solid aura. It has a lot of good units in it. Um, like you saw up there in the top of the arena, those King Barton crew scary... Oh, it's just... It's nasty. It's a nasty run. But there you go, guys. That is the Abyss Faction, in my experience. What I would say are the best ones, the mid-tier and the foods. Hopefully you've learned something today. If you did, don't forget, smash that thumbs up button and show your support if you haven't already. Don't forget to subscribe as well and tell your friends about it because that definitely helps me out a lot. And I will see you guys in the next one.